So we're continuing in our study on the life of David, talking about anointing, a study and identity. And this week we're talking about affirmation. You know, when God affirmed David as king and he sent the prophet Samuel, God and Samuel were the only ones saying king over David. His own family rejected the fact that God had anointed him king. They didn't want to follow him. Saul wasn't having it. He didn't want to stop being king. And then the nation of Israel didn't recognize him as king. And it's interesting because when God spoke kingship over David, it created uh, three different places of choice, three different places of conflict that had to be resolved in David's heart. The very first one was when God said king over a shepherd, the shepherd had to decide, am I going to come into alignment with what God is saying over my life? So David had to come into agreement with what God was saying over his life. That was the first conflict in his own heart. Can I be king? He was just a teenager at the time. He was a shepherd. He was out serving his family by protecting the flock. But here God comes and says, you're a king. You're going to be king over the whole nation. So David had to reconcile that in his heart. When God speaks things over our lives, when God speaks things over our identity, the first battle we have to win is coming into agreement with what God says versus or over and against the things that we already feel in our own heart that don't line up with what God's saying. God is speaking prophetically. God is speaking creatively. The God who created all of creation, he spoke everything to an existence. When he speaks something over your life, He is saying, this is what I have designed and created you for, and it's going to come to pass. And our job is to yield and come into an agreement and to begin to live according to the identity that God called out over us. The second conflict was the people around him who were saying the opposite of what God was saying. Uh, Saul, the king, absolutely said, David's not king. I'm the king. You don't get to be king. His brothers and his family didn't recognize him as king. And David had a choice. He had to decide, am I going to follow what God said over my life? Or am I going to start listening to what people are saying? The man pleasing, the, the people pleasing part of his life had to die. And he had to, in the face of adversity, begin to stand up in what God had called him to be not trying to usurp kingship, but begin in his own identity, in his own conduct, in his own character, to live out the life of what God has spoken over him, which is king. So there will be times in your journey where God calls you to something or he calls you to a thing, and the people around you say, is that really necessary? Did God really say? Uh, Are you supposed to be doing that? And we need to learn we're here to please God. We're here to follow God, not follow the crowd, not follow others. But we're here to here to hear the voice of God and live according to that. And then the third conflict is when society catches up with what God has said, perhaps years before, when people finally come around and recognize that the thing God spoke over us way back when, when they didn't believe it, they say, oh, I can see this in your life. I can see this is who you are. Then the third conflict is, in my own heart, do I, am I going to hold bitterness and resentment over the fact that, oh, now, now you want to come on board with this thing that I've been trying to walk out the last 15 years, the last 20 years. We see in the life of David, he didn't hold on to bitterness or resentment, that he had the character and the integrity to follow God regardless of what man was saying, regardless of what his own heart was saying. He brought his heart into alignment with God. And when society caught up, when the people around him, when the crowd caught up, he was gracious and humble and yielded to the hand of God. He didn't throw out, uh, I was right all along, you should have listened to me way back when, because he had the character that God had placed in him, because it wasn't about his own aggrandizement. So when people do finally recognize the gifts and talents that God has placed in you, we have to be challenged and we have to conquer the fact that we don't hold bitterness and resentment because they didn't believe us all those years. And then I would say the final thing is uh, not to allow once people affirm us, the people's affirmation to replace God's affirmation. Once people finally do recognize and finally do acknowledge what God has put inside of us, we cannot allow that to replace what God has said over us because the crowd is fickle. People will waver. People will come and go. They'll say one thing today. They might feel something differently tomorrow. We cannot allow people's affirmation to sway us from the affirmation of God, which is the foundation of our entire lives. So we hope you have a great discussion this week. We're glad that you're here with us. And let's look a little bit more about the life of David. Okay, so I'm, I'm curious about a couple things, Tim. Uh, just a couple? Just a couple. And this anointing bit, I was reading I was reading this story of David again uh, from even where we kind of picked off on our last sermons all the way up through to David being anointed. 
And it was bizarre. I got emotional when he's getting anointed and when he's getting affirmed by the elders. Right. And it was so bizarre to me. I didn't really expect that. To come out of yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting to see this faithful to what God showed him and wait for for people to recognize it. Yeah. And that's a, I think I got emotional because I recognized that's a hard that's a hard thing to choose. Yeah. How has that been for you in your journey of of waiting to to get the praise of man <laughs> so you could stay with the Lord? Yeah. Well, I I have to say that there was a place in my life that that had to die. Yeah. Because when I was young and I was stepping into I knew I wanted to serve God. I knew I had a call in my life for ministry. Yeah. You know, I wanted to help people. But my identity was so wrapped up in a title. My right. identity was so wrapped up in the position that I think I struggled for a lot of years um, chasing after the affirmation of people. Right. Even though God had spoken a thing over my life. So that thing had to die. Yeah. And it's interesting that when we get to the place where it really just doesn't matter anymore, mm -hmm. it's almost like that's where we're qualified. Like when we don't even want it anymore, when we don't desire it, when we don't need it. Mm -hmm. This is the place where it's like, okay, God's like open hand. You can have yeah. all this thing that you've, mm -hmm. you've been striving after now that you've given it up, now mm -hmm. that you've surrendered it to me. And it's interesting because those things can really easily pl replace God in our lives. It's the place of identity. Like I didn't know what to do if I wasn't a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a few years where I wasn't a pastor of anything. Right. Right. <laughs> Even my own family. I wasn't a pastor of anything. And I thought mm -hmm. those days were done. That, that's gone. I laid that down. I died to it. And then it's something that God resurrected down the road because his affirmation, his word, his identity over my life hadn't changed. Yeah. It was something in me that had to change. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, talk about getting emotional. There is a place of sacrifice. When God calls out something in us, there's a place of sacrifice and like there's a place of suffering that yeah. you walk through. Mm -hmm. And so when people finally like recognize like, Hey, I think, I think God's calling this out of your life. I think this is your design. Yeah. Like they recognize the thing you've been suffering for or suffering under. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a validation of, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm not crazy. Like it is worth it. Like, mm -hmm. so there's these moments I think where, when people like when David's finally anointed by the elders after being held off for the 15 years after God said King, it was a validation of all the time spent in the cave. Yeah. All the time running around in the wilderness trying to escape the spear of Saul. Mm -hmm. You know, dodging the Philistines, dodging, you know, his own king, his yep. own country, I mean, his own army. Like a validation of all the suffering and sacrifice that he had walked through. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It really does. And he acted during that whole time from being called an anointed as king by Samuel, mm -hmm. the next 15 years, he acted in a way that was investing in Israel. Yeah. Um, it, really profoundly. Like he invested a lot in that time that yeah. reveals that he believed that God was ultimately going to establish him as right. king in a formal way. Right. Because you don't invest in a company like that if you're not into its future. Right. You're not here for the long term. Exactly. Yeah. If you're not in the long term on a company, you're like, okay, how can I get mine and move on? You know what I mean? And, but it was so clear the way he invested and the way he did things that weren't beneficial to him alone, but to the whole kingdom in totality. He's like, this is going to be my kingdom one day. I'm going to act right now right. in its best interest. And I think we miss the risks he took. Right. Like going out to battle against an enemy when oh, yeah. the king is sitting in his palace with his army, not yep. going out to battle with the enemy, but David would take his men, you know, come out of the cave, out of the stronghold yeah. and go and fight the enemy. Because of his desire to serve the people, protect the people, mm -hmm. right? To love the people mm -hmm. that, that he was eventually going to be king over. But he wasn't there yet. It wasn't his responsibility. Right. But he had a heart for it. And I think we don't recognize, like, the risk he took in battle. Yeah. Like, okay, God says, you're going to win. Go do it. Okay, yeah. this is my faith in the word of God. I'm going to go out and I'm put my life on the line because I'm trusting yeah. in what God has said. And I have a heart to protect, to serve, to yeah. cover, to lead. Yeah. Right? And it wasn't his responsibility. It wasn't. And then, so I preach on how David goes and saves Keilah. Yeah. But what I didn't reveal, uh, preach on was the rest of that story yeah. of Keilah is that <laughs> Keilah 
Saul hears David's there and then he saves him from the Philistines. And so Saul's like perfect opportunity to go and get David and kill him. Right. Because the way Keala was constructed, it was an easier place to entrap him. There was gates and walls. And so, so David hears that Saul hears and he asks God, is he going to, is Keilah going to give me up? Right. And God's like, yep. They're going to give you up. up. They're going to sell you out. And he just got done saving them. Yes. Uh, And I see that story and I go, oh my goodness, I can relate to that. Right. Doing things for people and then they just turn around and sell you out. Yes. Because it's their benefit. And yet still, you could look at it hindsight and go, oh, I made a mistake. I should never have helped Keila. Right. But just because they betrayed you doesn't mean that it was a mistake to was, help them. wasn't still the right thing to do. Yeah. Our human heart could be like, I only want to help those who won't betray me. Yes. <laughs> Understandably. <laughs> but it's God's heart for you at times to help people that he knows will betray you. Yes. And how, what an invitation to intimacy with God. <laughs> yeah. How, how much has God done for people that ultimately turn around and betrayed him? This is the whole history of Israel. Yep. The blessing of God, and then they rebel Break and follow other. Yeah, yeah. they betray him. Yep. They backstab him every time. Yep. So when we walk that out, it's like, wow, we're identifying with the heart of God and these things. I was just praying for someone this morning and talking about how uh, sometimes it's the places where you've given the most. Yeah. You've served in love. You've sacrificed. Yep. You've born with. you gone into people's struggles, and you <laughs> walk with them, and then they end up getting upset and leaving and like... <laughs> Oh, they didn't, they didn't want to help me there. They didn't want to love me. And it's like, what? I don't know what else. You know what I mean? And it's a revelation of their brokenness. Yeah. Not that what we did was the wrong thing. Yeah. And God calls us to love and to serve without recompense or reward. Right. Because yeah. he is our reward. Yeah. And when people do have gratitude and it does create that bond of intimacy because they appreciate that, you know, you've come alongside to help them bear their burdens. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's like a bonus. Yeah. But the reward is that we're, we're, living and serving after the heart of God yeah. in the way that Jesus did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think about, I think about Saul's daughter, Michael, David's wife. Yeah. And the way she criticized David as he was dancing before uh, the ark and celebrating. Yeah. And there's this indictment that people can put on you. And I think that's sometimes really hard is that, okay, if I'm, I'm doing what the Lord's called me to do, and yet this person is very displeased with me now. Right. Yes. And you could really, sometimes you could take it to heart in a way that's very disturbing to you, unsettling. It robs you of peace. Right. And uh, I've had this conversation a lot with the Lord. It's like, okay, God, what's this balance here of being willing and receptive to hear feedback versus being moved by every assignment, uh, indictment, yeah. accusation? Yes. Because there's a lot of them that come my way. I'm sure there's a lot that come your way. <laughs> yeah, it's the nature. And you're like, if I get moved by every one of these, my day's going to be wild yeah. every day. And I'm going to lack peace and I'm going to be destroyed. Mentally, I think I'm going to go crazy yeah. if I give uh, credence to every one of these flybys, drive-bys. Right. And you're like, I guess I should take the rest of my day and now be anxious. Sort this out. Yeah, because yeah. man has rejected me or indicted against me. And what happened? Why? And, yeah. and, it, and I, I looked at how David responded and um, it corrected something inside of me, hmm. which was like, you, you don't have to bow to every indictment. That's not humility. Right. You can lovingly decline the narrative. Right. Yes. Yeah, I you know, I can't go along with you there because I have to go along with what God yeah God has put in me, what God has put on my heart. Yeah, like, this is pleasing to the Lord. You're telling me it's not. You're displeased, but I have to please God. It's like when the the council pulled in uh, Peter and John and said, "Don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus." Yeah, and they were like, uh, "We got to obey God rather than men." Yeah, you know, and and especially when it's someone you're in relationship with, it comes with that indictment or that complaint. Yep. of you should be doing it differently. And we're in relationship. That is a harder pill to swallow sometimes because it's like, wow, you know, I'm following after God and now you're telling me that I'm off track. Mm-hmm. So I think that as time has gone by, I've gotten better at more quickly. Yeah, yeah. God, am I on track? Like, am I off? Is, the, is there truth to this? Right. And then being able to, okay, whatever God says. Right. So when I go inquire of the Lord because people have had something to say, it's a lot quicker conversation than it used to be. Like I used to agonize yeah. you know, as a young pastor. I was like, cause people got opinions and, yeah. and everybody's mm-hmm. opinions. Like sometimes those 
contradict. Right. Right. And I used to agonize when people were in disagreement or they had a complaint or they, you should have be doing this. You should be doing that. And we shouldn't have done that. I would agonize for days. Like I would, I would stay up at night. Like I'd lose sleep over it. Yeah. But I found a place of peace in that. Like, you know what? The only opinion that matters is God's. And if I'm loving and following God and I'm loving people, even people in opposition, yeah. this is where second Timothy two verses 24 through 26 have been a great comfort to me. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, a servant of the Lord must be patient, able to teach those who are in opposition. Mm -hmm. If perhaps God would grant them repentance and they come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, mm -hmm. having been taken captive by him, the devil mm -hmm. to do his will. Recognize when people come in opposition, but I know, and then I, okay, I recheck with God. God says we're on the right track, but they're right. in opposition. I recognize, mm -hmm. oh, they're, they're held back. They're with, they're in a snare. They can't see mm -hmm. what God has said. They can't mm -hmm. see it. So I'm not mad at them. I'm not offended, mm -hmm. but I recognize what's going on yeah. behind the scenes, what, what's really happening. And I can pray for them. I can stay in humility. I can stay in gentleness and try mm -hmm. to speak truth in love but it doesn't mm -hmm. rob my sleep anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. The, the humility, I think it takes to go check with the Lord. Yeah. They go, okay, well let is me check. Truth to this? Yeah. Is there any truth to this? So David and Keila, he, he hears they're yeah. being attacked by the Philistines. And this is in the sermon, but he goes, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And he inquires of the Lord as he would always do. And then the Lord's like, go, you'll be victorious. And then he brings it to the people and the people are scared. Yeah. This is a really interesting point, right? Yeah. Because I, like in leadership as a church, like this conversation is inescapable. As a visionary, as a leader, as yeah. somebody building something, what do you do about the feelings, emotions, or things of people? Yes. Which can sometimes be at odds with where God is showing you to go. Right. Or bring them. Yes. And I often find, like, and I, you know, I'm curious about your thoughts on it, is I actually don't really find that most of the time it's not, because the people have ill will towards God's vision. Right. It's just they're concerned. Yeah. And there's, I think, a loving way to handle that. So I don't, so what, I, what I've learned from like studying the word and then even in my own leadership is that you don't yield to it, but you also don't ignore it. Yeah. Like, right. Like, yes. Like you deal with it. So you address it. You lovingly visit that place and, and David shows that he goes and he inquires of the Lord again. Right. And to that person, and I've always tried to encourage this and always tried to even in scripture show people like when you're making big life decisions, inquire of the Lord and then also seek wise counsel yeah. to help you sort through the complexity of your emotions, your yeah. families, your, your spouses, just the whole gauntlet of things really allow this like saturation of God's voice directly and then through trusted advisors yeah. to truly give you a clear picture and to inquire of the Lord in totality right rather than in isolation disconnected from everybody's desires right. or feelings and I think here's another place where it, when we get God's perspective we see what's going on behind the scenes when people come with a place of concern or objection there's something in them that's being challenged yeah it might be a place of faith in them that's being challenged. It might be a uh, lack of confidence in their own ability mm -hmm. to go down this road. Like yeah. maybe there's fear involved. The right. voice of fear has come. Yeah. So when people come with concerns, it's like, okay, God, what's your perspective? Because you see and know everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. It's not just because they've chosen to be an adversary. Something is, there's something behind this concern that's coming up. Right. Right. Yeah. There's a heart issue. Something going on there, whether they... You can't see it. Don't believe it. Maybe they need to inquire the Lord. Let's go inquire the Lord again yeah. and come back and reconfirm. Yeah. But when we see behind the scenes, I like, this is what I, I believe getting God's perspective does. When we see people the way God sees them, we can recognize, oh, this is a place of lack of identity, inadequacy, mm -hmm. fear, mm -hmm. like lack of confidence. Yeah. Or like in what I, what I used to operate in and what I've run up against I used to carry a religious spirit yeah. and that religious spirit had put God in a box that if anything went outside that box, I was like, well, God's not in that. Mm -hmm. And I became an objection and an adversary. Yeah. So when we recognize those things that are happening, it's like, okay, God, I'm going to stay true to what you're calling me to do, but also I'm going to bear in love with these people who are struggling with this because yeah. it might be a growth point for them. Mm -hmm. Like you might be pulling them out of 
this thing that God's like challenging them with. Yeah. Like he, he wants them to grow. Yeah. And they're like, you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of the, uh, of the many uh, phrases or, or language that you've carried uh, in your narrative and, and really honestly in your life message of heart freedom and, and, and different places like that. Yeah. One of the phrases or ideas that I've always loved is the picture you create with the language that, well, that's, you got to understand like that's their brokenness speaking yeah, and that's their brokenness acting. Right. And it was like, whoa, that's a really fantastic vision is to, you know, some would say separate the sin from the sinner and right. things of that nature. But I think it's a little, it, it's deeper when you say it like that, because when you, when you speak it as like, oh, that's their brokenness speaking, you could actually understand that. Yes, your mom or dad might love you, but until you recognize where they function in their brokenness, yeah. you're going to keep trusting them where you shouldn't trust them. Yes. And then you'll be confused and perplexed and you'll yeah. want to grab a hold of bitterness and, and feel cut wronged. offs and feel wronged. And I think a lot of people have a hard time reconciling like, okay, how can it be my, my mom or my dad or how can it be an uncle or how can it be a friend and also do that to me? Yes. And that's where that language comes in. Well, we'll understand it's their brokenness right. or understand it's the fear that ensnares them. Yeah. Like David could be like, how could you guys lose heart? Right. Keila needs our help. How what are you, a bunch of idiots? Yeah, you cowards. And he yeah. could have come down on them. Right. Uh, but he recognizes like, oh, this is their fear speaking. Yes. And so now I'm going to, with courage and kindness and patience, lead them well. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. I, I think it's so easy to make people the enemy because they have a face. Right. We can focus on them. We see them. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the enemy. Yeah. But when you recognize People are not the enemy. I mean, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not people, but we're wrestling against principalities, powers, rules, of weakness, high yeah. places. These are the places of brokenness in people's lives, the influence that the enemy has been able to create through wounding. So when I separate the person God created in his image from the brokenness that's coming out against me, yeah. that's the enemy. Yeah. Right? This is the place God wants to heal because Jesus died for this person that's become an adversary to me or a, 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 an offender to me. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I can separate people like that, it's like, okay, God loves them, even though they're doing things that are hurtful to me. Yeah. And the things they're doing that are hurtful to me are driven by the true enemy. Yep. Brokenness, pain, sin, like all those things, yeah. dysfunction, addiction. We keep going. <laughs> the list is long, <laughs> right? man. It's a lot. It rolls out. So when I separate the person, like, okay, now yeah. I can work with compassion. Doesn't mean I trust them. They're right. broken. Right. I don't know what they're going to do. Like, <laughs> they've shown a pattern of they're dangerous, right? Yeah. In a certain yeah. fashion. So I don't trust them, but I can stay in compassion with where they are, what they're stuck, the snare that they're in. Mm -hmm. And then I can respond with grace and with love and then recognize that I'm coming against the true enemy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I think it's actually for me, it's unlocked the ability to have mercy. Yeah when somebody is an abuser or is wrong. Yeah, yes. Um, and that was a really complicated code for me to crack personally. Yeah. Is because I'm naturally bent towards justice, the code of mercy was enigmatic to be simple. It was very puzzling. Right, it feels like, wrong. It, so. Exactly, it feels wrong and it reminds me of when David, after Saul dies, he affirms Saul and Jonathan. Right. And he tells the women of Israel, you should, th you should be grateful for the way Saul clothed you and adorned you with ornaments. Yeah. And he just, he basically just raves about these, about the bad, about guy. Saul, the bad guy. Yeah. And you'd almost think like, well, that's not, that's not right. That's not accurate. Right. That's not good. And yet David had the ability to, to understand because he did. And he showed it many times. He understood da Saul was wrong. And he understood Saul was to not be king and he was to be king. Right. So he knew what was ordained by God right. and where Saul was at in, in his leadership. So he wasn't ignorant. Um, and yet he was still honoring. Yeah. So the Lord will deal with them, that idea. Yeah. The Lord, the vengeance is the Lord's. So I think it's, it's an inaccurate Christian vision to believe that nobody is going to get justice. Right. Right. That would be a lie. Yeah. Um, but it's also an inaccurate, full biblical picture to believe that no one's going to get mercy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And here's another level of complication. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
when the Bible says that mercy triumphs over justice, mm -hmm. there are parts of me that feel like that's not like God, no, <laughs> like God, no. they don't deserve mercy. Yeah. They deserve justice. Yeah. And then I have to turn around and realize I don't deserve mercy. I deserve justice, but God gave me mercy. Yeah. And then he's inviting me to give mercy and grace to those who have wronged me. Mm -hmm. And this is a place in me that has to die. I have to give up yep. my right yep. to vengeance, justification. So just I have to give up my right. I'm surrendering it to God. Mm -hmm. Because in my life, the justice that I deserved was poured out on Jesus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's easy to look at the offender and say, they deserve justice. Mm -hmm. The hard truth is that justice does not heal. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. but mercy can. Mm -hmm. And that's what feels so upside down. Yeah. This is where the kingdom of God is upside down from the world. Yeah. There are people deserving of justice. They're deserving of, you know, getting what they deserve, like their right rewards. Right. And God says, but grace, it will transform it. Yeah. Like grace will defeat mm -hmm. the true enemy. Yeah. And it'll bring this one who was bound in chains to freedom. Yeah. That's what grace, it's what it yeah. did in my life. Yeah. It's hard to walk it, watch it walked out in the life of someone who's deeply wounded us. Yeah. Right. And yeah. when they've done things that have been deeply crushing and painful, like it feels so unjust, but that's what the cross was. Yeah. The cross was an injustice mm -hmm. that the innocent one paid for the things we did. Yep. The things that I did. Yep. And so if I want that grace, I have to be willing and allowing God to absolve and give grace and mercy to those that I want to see punished. Yeah. Right. That has to die in me. Yeah. That place of justice. Yeah. And this is why Paul wrote, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And like, um, not to get off track, but you know what Jonah's problem was? <laughs> why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? Oh, yeah. At the very end, he right. says, God, I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were going to send me to speak justice over this nation, and yeah. then you were just going to turn around and give them mercy. Give mercy. And they don't deserve it. Was, like, yeah. he couldn't handle it. Yeah. And he ended, the book of Jonah, he ended angry. <laughs> like, they never reconciled. He was still mad. Right? Yeah. I identify with Jonah. Right. right? I, I feel that. I felt that. But then when I come back to when I re realize the grace and mercy God has given me, then I'm, I'm grateful for mm -hmm. grace and mercy. Yeah. And because I can be grateful for grace and mercy, then I can, yeah, I can allow for it. my enemy, yeah. my offender, my uh, abuser yeah. to receive it as well. Yeah. No, it's really powerful. It was interesting the way, you know, why did it take so long with Saul? Yeah. It, well, perhaps there was many windows where Saul could have repented mm -hmm. and seen a mercy from God. Maybe it wouldn't have ended with him realizing kingship, but maybe it would have ended with him being preserved. Right. And his line being preserved. Right. Like Jonathan had a vision of him serving David as king. Yes. So, you know, in, in that journey, there were, there's so many different examples in the Bible where characters seek repentance, humble themselves, yeah. sackcloth and ash moments, yep. and God allows a redemptive narrative yep. for them. He, he removes the judgment he's already spoken yeah. over. Yeah. And Saul's perspective, though, was really interesting because he, he couldn't ascertain that repentive walk because he had this victim mindset, which he kept saying things like, the yeah. Lord is not, uh, the Lord's not for me. And he just kept on talking about what the Lord wasn't doing for him. Right, right. And I read commentary on it that was like, it's really interesting that he didn't ask the right question, which is, the Lord's not for me, am I for the Lord? Right. And it's just this simple question. The victim goes, God's not for me. But the humble person goes, well, am I for the Lord? Yeah. Well, and I think because insecurity is a form of pride. Right. right? It's all about how yeah. is this going to affect me? Yep. How, how, do, how does this make me feel? Like it's self-focused. Right. And so when we lack identity then we're so insecure and so paranoid that our whole world, our whole existence revolves around us resolving and reconciling what's in this for me. Right. But when we have identity, I can risk. I tell people all the time, we can risk loving because we know yeah. we're so deeply loved by God. He's got us. Yeah. So we can take those risks. Yeah. Saul couldn't take those risks. No. Nope. He was so bound up in a lack of identity and a place of insecurity. That's why he's asking the wrong questions. Like, mm -hmm. What's in it for me? How will this affect me? Who's fighting for me? Nobody loves me. It's all focused on what he's lacking rather than what God could do. And yeah. not having the faith. This is where not trusting God enough. This is ironic to me. Saul is sitting in the, the king's throne over the people of God. 
put there by God. Right. And he's going to stay there. Yeah. But the whole time, God doesn't love me. He's not for me. Yeah. He's out yeah. to destroy me. Like everything you have is because of God. Yeah. And even if your circumstances change, to not believe that God would be with you, yeah. that lack of faith is what cost him. Yeah. I mean, he, he went from looking for goats. Like that was where he was found by Samuel to donkeys. be con- donkeys. Excuse me. Yes. Somebody would have caught it. Yeah, yeah. Somebody would have caught it. Somebody would have caught it for sure, for sure. Um, But he went from that to being king. And from the beginning, he had these very clear signs of insecurity, hiding in the baggage. His language about when Samuel talked to him was, I'm just from a lowly tribe. And um, the the curious thing to me is is even when Saul um, gets spared by David the first time, David cuts off a piece of of his cloak and then tells him about it. It's interesting because actually, the, if you read what Saul's talking about, it's like he makes peace with David. Yes. It appears to be. Um, and then each time after that he went and hunted him, it was somebody went and told him yes. about what David was up to, stirred Saul up, yes, moved by man's opinion, and I and can went imagine back on his and word. went back on his word. And it's so interesting to me, like in this moment, David speaks truthfully how God is moving him to speak. And Saul probably recognized the voice of God because he had heard it at points in his life. Yeah. He hears David talking. He goes, no, that's right. Yeah. That's yes. good. This is like David playing the heart form again. He's like, this is the good spirit. This is the spirit that soothes me. This right. is good. And he's like, I agree with this. And he goes back to his court. And somebody talks in his ear. Yes. And then he, because he's moved by man, yes, he's moved by this man. He's moved by that man. Whoever's the, the, he's so conflicted, so conflicted, like a wave of the ocean, just tossing yeah. back and forth. Cause he has no anchor. He has no North star. It's just whoever's the strongest voice in the room. Right. He's moved by. And he's right. like, you're right. I do want to kill David. Yeah. That guy's a jerk, man. You're right. I'm going go to go get me. He's, he's going to take my me. kingdom. Yeah. And the second time David goes, who, who spoke to you about me and riled you up like this? Yeah. And when he spared him the second time with a spear, he says this, and I was like, oh my goodness, I really, I don't know if I ever recognized, like David recognized that he was manipulated by man. Right. And he yeah. spoke to it. Yeah. He called him out on it. He goes, who manipulated you? Remember our last conversation? Yeah. We were we good. We had an agreement. Yeah. We had an agreement. And now you're here trying to do it again. And it's really interesting. David recognized the man pleasing. He recognized yeah. Saul's ability to be manipulated by men. And I think it's interesting too, if you look at the contrast of David and Saul, When Saul, who had the responsibility as king, wouldn't fulfill his responsibility as king. But here David is. And it started with Goliath. Yeah. Like it it has always struck me that, okay, here comes a giant. The Bible says Saul was head and shoulders taller than everybody in Israel. Who should have been the champion to go out and confront the giant? Yeah. It should have been Saul. Yeah. But he's cowering on the sidelines like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Not fulfilling. And here comes David, steps right in. Yeah. And then with um, Kiila. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I listened to the audio Bible of that a bunch. It was yeah. like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I always practice the Bible names. Yeah, just in case. Just in case somebody out there really knows. I just kind of mumble towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when Keilah's under attack, who should have defended Keilah? It yeah. should have been Saul, Saul and his for armies. Sure. For sure. He's sitting there in the palace until David steps into the gap. Yeah. And then David goes and fulfills the responsibility that Saul should have. And now Saul comes running out, not to help Keilah, but to go after David again. So it's so interesting how where David was fulfilling the responsibility of a king and Saul is not. It's showing why David was qualified and Saul was not qualified. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's profound what you said about Saul being head and shoulders above others. Yeah. And in basketball, sports. Yeah. Uh, the tall guy that was always the tallest guy is the most uncomfortable when another person taller enters the game. Yes. Because they're not used to being I've shorter, this way. smaller, uh, physically it less. So they hit an insecurity that's new to them. Yes. So I imagine Saul was like, wait, what? so hold on. I've always had confidence in my warrior capacity. Yes. I can't win this one by my own physical confidence. Yeah. And he was, he was confronted with a physical insecurity that he hadn't had before. Right. Which is so unique to me. It's like, you, and this is, I think, why it's so important for people to like become a king before they're a king. Yeah. Because when you're a king, 
all of those insecurities that are in your foundation are going to be absolutely targeted by the enemy. Yes. And so whatever cracks you have in your trust relationship with God, yeah. you can bet, you can bet the enemy is going to leverage situational stuff yeah. to stress that crack in your foundation. And it reveals what our confidence is in. Yeah. Where our strength lies. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm confident in the strengths and abilities that I have, I'm in a dangerous place, mm -hmm. right? Because I need to be confident in what God is providing and what God is doing through me in, in me, mm -hmm. not in what I can bring. Yeah. So when Saul has confidence in his own ability and then he recognizes, wow, they might be better than me. I think they could take me. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden fear has a voice. Whereas David, like everybody that looked and everybody told David, yeah. you can't win this. Mm -hmm. You're too small. Yeah. He'll kill you. He'll squash you. Mm -hmm. But David's confident wasn't in his own abilities. It yeah. was in God yeah. and God's abilities. Yeah. And so when those things happen, it's like uh, we were praying for somebody today and I told him, yeah, you're not going to get to use any of your strengths. <laughs> you're in a situation of life where no qualification you have will work. Yeah. Like you've just got to surrender it and allow God to move. Yeah. And like, I don't like hearing that. <laughs> That's not helpful to me. I don't know what, the, I don't know what God's going to do. And, and I can't, I can't sit on my hand. I can't do anything. Yeah. That's a scary place to be, but it's Very a place scary. of faith. Yeah. It's an expression of faith. Um, I, I never have liked when the cliches are true. Yeah. I really have. And it's always bothered me. <laughs> and when I feel the phrase that's a cliche about to come out of my mouth, I'm like, booger. Well, what a booger. And, and these moments of trusting God, having faith in him, yeah. not resting on your own strength. All of these cliches are, are so doggone true. And yet they're so good. Yeah. They're so powerful. And it's like Jesus take the wheel moments are unknowingly true. Yes. Unknowingly true. And it's a song and everyone talks about stuff like that. And I'm like, ah. and I've always hated it because to me, it's always been like uh, essentially a Christian's excuse for not doing anything. Right. As I've observed it in the past. Yeah. Um, but then doggone it. Sometimes it's absolutely like it's, sometimes a Christian was absolutely doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's really powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's really powerful. And I, I think what I, what allowed me to reconcile, like, okay, what's my part and what God's part is been the, the language of blessing. When I understood God's blessing to be essentially the rain and the agricultural cycle, yeah. I went, there it is. Cause you can plow the ground, mm -hmm. you can sow the seed, you can wake up early, you could be diligent, you could do everything in your own, uh, responsibility. Right. But it, heck, if it doesn't rain, all your work's futile. Right. futile. Right. And that's, I think, the part when we're talking about, okay, trust God. It's like trust him for the rain. Don't trust him to sow the seed that you're responsible exactly. to sow. Don't trust him to plow the ground that you're responsible to plow. Trust him for the rain. Yes. So do what is in your responsibility, in your scope that God has assigned to you. Be diligent in it, faithful right. in it, a good steward of it, and then go, okay, yeah. the rest is you, it's God. up to God. I've done everything I can do. Everything, everything I've called to do. Yep. Yeah. And I trust you to reign. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's where David was. Like David stepped out on the battlefield. Yeah. But his whole demeanor was, it's God that's going to give us the victory. It's God yeah. that's going to do the thing. And I've been doing stuff. I've been killing lions. Right. I've been killing bears. I took care of everything I've ever been given responsibility over. So here I am now. And I know it's new. I've never done this specific thing. Right. But God hasn't failed me yet. Yeah. I, and I was thinking too, we were talking about affirmation. David wasn't concerned about being affirmed before he had accomplished anything. Right. I think sometimes we get stuck in it. Like we have a dream and there's something we suspect God might be saying like, but we want people to affirm it before we'll step out. Yeah. And, I, and I've met a lot of people and I, I can remember seasons of my life where I felt this way. Like I feel this from the Lord, but I want someone else to affirm me before I take the risk. Right. And God's like, no, my voice is all you need. Step out. Take the risk. Yeah. Follow me, regardless of what people are saying. Yeah. Because if my identity rests in what people say, I'm never going to move. Yeah. Right? Because they might not see it. Like they're not God. Yeah. That's powerful. You got anything else? No, I think that's most of it. That's most of it for me too. <laughs> well, hey, listen, we love you guys. Hopefully, this was really powerful and helped you a lot. 
and uh, we'll continue to do more series yeah. and podcasts connected to sermons and other things, foundations, uh, biblical foundations, yeah. Christian foundations. We're doing a bunch on those and uh, many other things and other discipleship themes will be coming through in yeah. here. Uh, I love it. It's been awesome. Uh, you and, and your wife, Pam, have been so incredible. There's powerful things to learn. And it, the, the amount of data and information that needs to be transferred in this discipleship journey is yeah. robust. Yeah. And so I love that about podcasts. Yes. It, it, in addition to sermons, it provides a different delivery of content. Right. A different look at it, a different yeah. perspective. Yeah, it's dynamic. Yeah. I love it. So love you guys. Hopefully this is great.